we're in Grenada, uh, we go back to the United States, I put the children in public school. So here we go. I had no idea that uh, education would be uh, any different from sort of what I'd had. I had had a good education, a private school education, but I didn't know. And so they go into the, the public school system in Camden, Maine, and in retrospect, I believe that that was a pilot school, one of them for the whole country, for changing our education system from an academic classical educational system to uh, brainwashing for uh, the international socialist government. Uh, we, everybody has all the research on this. I have so much. It's all in my book, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. I hit Camden and I start asking, you know, I get on a little committee, uh, philosophy committee, and we we're all asked by the superintendent, highly skilled change agent out of Harvard, uh, well, I want to know what all of you feel the purpose of education should be. You know, and so I, I said, well, I think it should be uh, to give the, the students a, uh, a sound uh, academic education in, in uh, basics and, uh, and also a strong sense of sound morals and values. And boom, they all looked at me and they said, whose values? And I thought, hey, what's going on here? I said, well, what's happened in my country? I mean, don't we still have the same values? I mean, uh, what, don't we all sort of agree? You don't steal, you don't rob, you don't, you don't kill babies, uh, you don't kill people in war, you don't, you know, you know, all, a lot of things that I thought we, we believed in. You don't lie. Everything was changing, and I saw it, and I saw the curriculum coming in, and I went for the, the values clarification training myself to find out. I had a call from a master teacher who taught all over the world, and she said, you are absolutely correct. I, I was on the school board by that time. After three tries, I got on. And she said, you're absolutely correct. I want to pay for you to go for some in-service training. And I said, in what? And she said, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, not, it's called Innovations in Education, and it's how to become a change agent. She paid $100 for me to go. I went. and. All these normal looking people, nice, some from my own school district and all. And, and the guy is a, a facilitator, but he's using this big book called Innovations in Education, A Change Agent's Guide. And it has all these case studies of teachers and administrators and how to sneak in controversial curriculum, such as death ed, sex ed, bullying ed, uh, alcohol ed, drug ed, you know, all these programs that have education hanging off the end of them, that have nothing to do with education. It's interesting. You don't have math ed and science ed and all. They call it math and science and history, right? But when you see anything with education hanging off the end of it, red flag, huh? In that training, uh, he taught us how to identify resistors in our community and they were the people who were smart, who knew that these programs were designed for nothing other than to make children engage in sex, to drink, to take drugs, to do all the things that the programs, were, the parents were being told the programs were to help the children. I was considered a resistor too. Here, here they were training, training me to identify myself. Huh? And so I never ever got over that. Also, we were being trained to go to the important people in the community, and they're really very good people. We all know who they, they are. They're friends of ours and all, but they're head of Rotary, head of Garden Club, head of the Historical Society. You go to them, and you explain to them in very, very good, you know, uh, highly skilled change agent uh, manner, which is just lies, how important these programs are for your children. We've got to put these programs in. This was 1973, all the way through right now. Huh? That period in education, we call it the unfreezing of our children's values, the ones taught by the parents at home and, and the church, basically. Change agents were highly trained by the National Training Laboratories. We had the headquarters for that in Bethel, Maine. That goes all the way back to World War II. I have the original paper from that, and it said that what they're putting in is the they want to change the values to unfreeze the system and then they're going to implement the new values, the new communist values for world government. Huh? So that was the goal uh, and they did a good job on it between 1970 and the year 2000 
And now the value is, as we can all see, people are saying, oh, well, we've got to be tolerant. You know, there are no, no absolutes anymore. That's not fair to, to judge people. Don't be judgmental. If your, your grandmother is dying of cancer and can't afford, uh, you can't afford the medicine, uh, it's okay to steal it. You know, that's what you call uh, values clarification uh, with the uh, education for a planned economy using uh, workforce training, uh, to identifying children at a very early age, what they're going to do the rest of their lives. It's the Soviet uh, planned economic system, starting as early as first grade. Uh, that's being put in now uh, under the guise of school choice, charter schools, and using the uh, performance-based, outcome-based uh, Skinnerian Pavlovian method with a computer. Pavlov, interestingly enough, was uh, a Russian. People think that he invented uh, operant conditioning. He didn't. He went to Leipzig, Germany, and uh, he studied under Wilhelm Wundt in the 1800s, mid-1800s. Wilhelm Wundt was a philosopher, German philosopher, who uh, was involved in trying to figure out how you can get people to do change, you know, understanding the uh, psychology, what makes people click, uh, how you can get them to do what you want them to do, etc. And he became very frustrated with uh, the inability to change people's behavior and their views and everything, uh, doing the traditional way, you know, lectures and this and that and all, and discussions and all. And finally, he realized that what he was dealing with was the human soul. The soul is a very difficult thing to track. It sort of floats all over the place and it rebels and it doesn't, you know, it, it's independent. And so he came up with a scheme to uh, attack the, the nervous system. That's really what it is. It's neurological. If you can get them to react in certain ways to what you want, like, like when the doctor, give you a good idea, the doctor used to, physical exams, they'd, they'd take a hammer, a little rubber thing and knock your knee and it goes boop. So he figured, well, you know what? We, we can operate on that thesis where we, we attack the, uh, the nervous system. And it's a stimulus response thing. So you have to provide the stimulus in order to get the response. Well, if it was dog training, the stimulus would be a dog biscuit or something. And ultimately, you know, when the dog sees you pull, taking the biscuit out of the, the box, uh, he's gonna do what you want, right? And uh, so it's really, really pretty simple. I had, I had never gotten involved in having to figure it out until, uh, until uh, a very good friend of mine, a teacher in Arizona, had to go through the first program that was brought out of 19, 1965. One of the first ones was called Mastery Learning. And she quit education when she went through the training. She said it was so sick. And she had, she had do papers from doctors and all saying it, made the ch it even makes children sick. And she, I met her when I went into the U.S. Department of Ed because I found her correspondence came to my office and it was referred to me. And that was how I met her. And she was the one who educated me about upward conditioning and, and how, how awful it is. I mean, it can absolutely destroy free will. We had free will until we got to the computer. The computer absolutely uh, destroys. The child cannot, is, there's no thinking going on there. There's no transfer being made. And you've got to understand that. All the documents in regard to this by, by people, not myself, by educators who have been trained in it are in my book. So you don't have to say Charlotte said that. You know, you can say Professor so-and-so said that. Uh, I, I have one incredible paper in the back of my book by a, a leading educator written in the 60s that I managed to get. It was attached to the Project Best application for funding hmm? that I talked about, the one I got fired for. And that paper talks about the need for computers and how wonderful they're going to be and all. But he says, if you don't agree with a message morally and ethically that's going on to that software, do not do it. And that's coming right out of the mouth of an educator involved in it. He says, you have to have a conscience because that software is so powerful that no matter, you may think, oh, well, the person on the other end, you know, he can do what he wants and make up. No. Once it's in the software and once the child is clicking away on the computer and getting the little happy face as the reward, hmm, 
That's what happens. We all know that feeling when we get something good on the computer. He's not going to ask any questions. That's it. Finished. And it can bring the student to a certain totally opposite position in their thinking using Socratic questioning. So it's very dangerous. I can't tell you how dangerous it is. I mean, how dangerous is a method that can actually change, ab actually destroy one's conscience? Hmm? That's bad news. And we were all softened up, and that's what we're looking at today. Now, the refreezing has to take place. The refreezing is going to take place with the use of the computer. Schools will be bookless. I, they are already some, uh, some of these programs coming in. So anyway, I, I was on the board. I saw that. I went for the retraining. Then I, I get, got off the board, and, and I formed with Bettina Dobbs of Maine, a wonderful teacher and a nurse. I formed, we formed something called Guardians of Education for Maine. And uh, we were in business for about 15 years. We did a lot of very good work. In uh, 1980, I went to work for Ronald Reagan, uh, and I worked there for two years until I was fired. Right? But uh, I had worked hard for him from 1978 to get him elected. Right? And then in 1980, because of the work I'd done uh, and the work in education, they put me, I got an appointment in the U.S. Department of Education. Because... The people in Washington, with the, the, the conservatives, they were good back then. They're not anymore. Uh, they were uh, very, they were very impressed by the work I'd done in Maine uh, on education. So they pulled me down and put me in the U.S. Department of Ed in what was the most important slot, probably in the world, in education. I know people out there are shaking their head and say, "Why would they put her there? She doesn't have a college education, right?" Why are they putting her in there? Well, they knew, uh, first of all, Reagan had promised to get rid of the Department of Education, something he didn't do, and I will hold that against him forever, because he could have. Since that was the plan, when, the, when they were staffing the department, they didn't have to put important people in those old slots, like my slot that I got put into would have been filled by the former president of Harvard, or Stanford, or something, right? Or University of Chicago. That job had been held in the past by very important people in education. But since they were getting rid of the department, it didn't make any difference. Hmm? So they just plopped me in. Now talk about the hand of God, huh? And all my files were full of everything they planned on doing. And so I don't even think my boss knew this. You know, he was a so-called conservative. But he became very suspicious about me because I was always busy. Uh, even though I didn't have a lot of work to do from him, I was always busy because I had lots of things to read. And I would stay after work. I'd stay until 2 a.m. in the morning when everybody was gone. I'd get into everything. Sure, if, if, if it had just been the job and all the files and everything had been, had been whisked away by these former very important educational change agent communists, Marxists, uh, I would not have found stuff. But all the stuff was left in the office. What I saw was so depressing. That's hardly the word. I mean, this was, this was the education of Charlotte. It was the greatest horror story I had ever encountered. And at one point, he sent me, he, he wanted to get rid of me out of that office. He sent me up to the National Institute of Education, which is where all the research is performed. They send out all the grants and contracts to the universities or schools or whatever from there. I found out I was really in the belly of the beast right there because I, I had access to all the computer printouts of all the grants and contracts of your money folks going out not just in, across our country but all around the world about how to change the education system from academics to a brainwashing using Pavlovian, Skinnerian, opera conditioning computers and workforce training for the globalist economy the corporate fascist socialist communist government that's coming right in this minute. I had a friend from Maryland who used to come and she had a huge Cadillac and uh, I'd get all my stuff and put it in, interesting for many people, L.L. Bean bags. You know those big L.L. Bean bags? Those huge ones. And I'd put all the papers in there and at lunchtime we'd, we'd meet uptown for lunch. She'd come in, marvelous gal, Australian, who I absolutely love, probably one of the finest Americans who ever 
uh, she was Australian, but she did more for our country than anybody I've ever known. Brilliant. We'd meet, dump the stuff in her car, go have lunch. She'd take it home. She'd get some of it out to the people across the country.